There is no shortage of contentious issues when it comes to China and the West. Beijing has flexed its financial muscle, muscle to pressure the United States, canceled a summit meeting with European leaders, and alleged that the Copenhagen Climate Conference was a, quote, conspiracy to divide the developing world. It had been hoped that our increased trade and interaction with China would strengthen the forces of democracy there. But as tensions continue to grow, it would appear that China and the West are on a bit of a collision course. Is this vision of a belligerent China accurate? If so, should the West take a tougher stand with China? We'll debate that tonight, live from the Monk Center here at the University of Toronto. Agenda with Steve Pakin. Funding for the Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Vale Inco Limited, a pioneering nickel mining company transforming mineral resources into essential ingredients for everyday life. Ontario's 33,000 chartered accountants, public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at casforchange.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us at the Bunk Center tonight on the downtown campus of the U of T, where we gather on the final Thursday of every month. This is kind of our home away from home and focus on international affairs. Tonight, a look at the growing tension between China and the West. And joining us for that discussion, Gordon Chang, columnist at Forbes.com and the author of The Coming Collapse of China. Wenren Jiang, political science professor at the China Institute at the University of Alberta and senior fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation. Charles Burton, political science professor at Brock University who's been watching China for almost 40 years now. And Sarah Kutulakos, executive director at the China, Canada China Business Council rather. It's good to have everybody here. Wenren, thanks for coming all the way from Alberta for this tonight. Good Thank to have everybody me. for tonight's discussion. You know, of course, about some of the recent irritants in China, uh, the Taiwan <coughs> arms sale, which they were not very happy about, uh, the situation with Google, where some hacking taking place on Google has made Google question whether they want to stay in China. China and the West, Gordon, let's start with you first, have been huffing and puffing at each other for a very long time. Is there any reason to believe things are more serious now? I think that they probably are. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, the normal tension in the U.S.-China relation. And I think part of it is that they wanted to test President Obama, for instance. So there seems to be more American issues. But I think part of it is also structural in the sense that there might be some internal dissension inside the regime in Beijing and, you know, over succession, over who knows what. And I think the part of it is that when you have this political struggles, it's very difficult for senior officials to take accommodating positions with other nations, and especially the United States. So I think that part of this really sort of reflective of the nature of the regime. Sarah, is the huffing and puffing more serious these days? I, I guess I would tend to agree with Gordon, but maybe even worry about it a bit, a bit less. You know, some of the, the tensions we're seeing with the U.S. It looks to me like deja vu. You know, the, someone visits with the Dalai Lama and. China needs to make noise about it. Um, same thing with arms sales to Taiwan. However, you know, it is important to look at the patterns of what we're seeing. You know, China does show some, uh, you know, some inclination to try to flex its muscle every once in a while. And is that flexing kind of the ebb and flow, or are they really trying to show more power? I think that's something that can't be answered in just one, one day. Uh, and certainly the internal tension that's going on is, uh, is very much there. And Win Ren Zhang, how do you see it? Well, I think there are both existing and uh, historical issues like Taiwan, Tibet, the tensions between two big powers. One is existing, another is rising, inevitable. Some people say, well, this phase of tension will pass, much ado about nothing. But there are new issues, though, on the other hand, Google versus China. This is how to handle information issues, information warfare, cyber attacks in the future, you know, geostrategic military manner. I mean, climate change, Copenhagen now squarely by the West, virtually blamed on China. China saying, not our fault. So how do you kind of deal with these newly emerging issues? That's, I think, we need to explore further. Charles, you took your first trip to China when? Uh, 1978. 
1978. You've been watching it for a long time. Before that, yeah. How do you think? Well, I think that there is a, a, a lot of difference in the way China is responding with the West as compared to the past. The, the nature of the relationship has changed. It used to be that the West gave China financial aid, which meant that China was more amenable to agreeing to uh, participate in Western-dominated regimes. Those days are over. It's become a, a shift in balance between who needs who more. And it seems that China is now able to, to uh, challenge the West and say, well, you know, uh, if you sell arms to Taiwan, we're going to make it hurt. We'll, we'll stop buying from Lockheed and Boeing. At least they make such threats. Or if you see the Dalai Lama, we won't engage in, we won't come to, to meet your president. And so this is different from the past where there, where there was the huffing and puffing, but you know, once the Dalai Lama flew back to India, uh, nothing seemed to happen. Now it seems that things are starting to happen, and that does suggest that uh, the West is under a, a, something of a challenge in knowing how to address this new situation. Although the, the most recent meeting with the Dalai Lama and President Obama was, was pretty quick and not very public, wasn't it? Yes, I, I, I would I say that so. I think that, um, you know, previously that when the Dalai Lama was in Washington for the first time since 1991, the United States president did not meet with the Dalai Lama. And I think the expectation of not meeting with the Dalai Lama was that China would give. You know, would China make some concessions on the currency issue so the U.S. could have better access to the Chinese market? Or would China, um, you know, be amenable to agreeing to, to some uh, uh, um, resolution of the Copenhagen Accords. Turns out that not meeting with the Dalai Lama got the United States nothing. If anything, it seems that the, the China got the perception that the United States was weak, hmm. and thereby it emboldened China to become more confrontational and assertive, which was exactly the opposite to what President Obama and, uh, and Hillary Clinton, I think, anticipated. Okay, let me just do some business with the folks at home for a second. We've got a bunch of different ways to enhance your enjoyment of tonight's broadcast. Obviously, we're on television on TVO between 8 and 9 p.m., if you dial us up online, Mike Miner, who's our fifth column blogger, is hosting an online chat on our website, tvo.org slash the agenda. Go to the Inside Agenda blog and you can participate with your fellow viewers tonight, uh, fellow viewsers tonight, if I can use that word as well, uh, in participating in a chat about tonight. So Mike is there, tvo.org slash the agenda. He's moderating that. And remember, we'll be following up tonight's broadcast with a live web chat where you can put your questions, your comments to our guests. We'll do that at 9 p.m. Eastern Time after the broadcast is finished. And again, at that time, uh, they will be happy to take your comments and questions. You can dial us up right now and uh, start to put those comments and questions in if you like. Let me read you all something from Der Spiegel on the issue of commerce and reform. Here we go, Michael. Let's bring this board up. The Communist Party's increasing confidence means China is set to become more of a troublemaker on the international stage and more brutal in its crackdown on dissidents. The Chinese government is brimming with self-confidence bordering on arrogance. The Chinese see themselves as the winners of the global economic crisis. The West should bid farewell to its cherished notion that China's economic progress will lead to political liberalization and turn it into a responsible partner on the world stage. The reverse is likely to be the case. Gordon, you agree with that? Well, I think that there's certainly a lot of truth to that. Um, I think part of the problem um, you know, it's not just this self-confidence. I think that there are problems in the regime. Also, you've got to remember that China has become a very unruly society. There were perhaps more than 127,000 mass incidents in 2008. And so I think that you, you have all of this economic engagement with China has created a very interesting, very volatile to society. And the Communist Party has a hard time actually trying to keep up. So I think that, yes, political and an economic engagement is changing China. It's going to change China for the better. But nonetheless, we could have some very turbulent periods between now and then, because it might not be a gradual evolution that everybody wants. It could go back to what we've seen in Chinese history, which is very, very difficult, turbulent, chaotic, and even violent political changes. Sarah, should we get rid of this idea that trade liberalization is going to lead to a political liberalization over there? I, I wouldn't give up that idea, but I think it's important to look at what might be behind some of the sort of bellicose behavior that you see, because although the statement says that China may have seen itself as, as, as winning through this global economic crisis, there are signs of fragility in the economy, and the government would rather not have its, uh, the, the, uh, its people focus on that. So by taking a strong position on the world stage, it increases feelings of nationalism, which sometimes are good, sometimes are bad, I think, in the opinion of the Chinese government. 
government. But in doing that, it helps them feel more confident, perhaps directing attention away from some of the weaknesses of the economy. Hmm. Wonder and Jack? Well, actually, I'm not sure I agree with this kind of Western consensus somehow recently emerging as if China is now with economic power growing, with military power growing, somehow getting more confident and therefore more arrogant in dealing with you know, external players, internal issues. China perceives itself very differently. The leadership, many fairly well-informed uh, intellectuals in the policy circle feel a more sense of crisis rather than confidence. They feel China today, Gordon mentioned some of those elements of internal issues. China, by per capita income levels, about you know $3,000. There's not even close to be a global superpower. They know that. And then the issue of social instability, about jobs and jobs. It's not just here in the United States that we talk about jobs. They talk about jobs in China as well. And there's international environment. What we here in the West perceive to be an emerging arrogant China, but the Chinese themselves actually perceive themselves as being more and more, in some sense, militarily, economically, and polit politically squeezed by the Western countries, if not in a con conspiracy sense, but in some ways they're pressuring China to do something China is not ready to do. Charles, and they're not ready to take up that. Sorry, do you yeah. agree, Charles, that they, they don't see themselves as arrogant the way we, I shouldn't say we, but some in the West believe? Oh, I think that they see themselves as, as deserving of respect. I think that from our point of view, our expectation had been when China started to uh, open up its economy that there would be uh, changes in the political system commensurate, that a middle class would form and this middle class would, would own property and want to have a, uh, a political system be res responsive to their property rights and would feel an entitlement to rights. And we haven't seen um, this developing the way we had hoped. China did uh, uh, sign the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1998. And when you sign one of those covenants, the expectation is that you will change your laws and procedures to, to become compliant with the demands of the covenant and then, and then ratify. But all those things that, that China, by signing, suggested that they would do, such as free elections and uh, freedom of expression and freedom of association and uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, all these things which, which we regard as the universal entitlement of all citizens, have not been, uh, 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 we haven't seen any progress towards ratification of that covenant. And so there's no question that, that our assumption that China's economic rise would see China smoothly uh, entering into international regimes and following along with a, a shared consensus of values of, of how a regime should behave domestically and internationally has not come to pass. And, when, and that's a cause for considerable concern for all of us. Do you agree that the progress has been very slow? I agree the progress is there, but uh, I disagree with Charles' assessment on how we view China. Charles has been observing uh, China for a long, long time. So I would say let's look at historically where China is heading to in the past three decades. Let's not see past several months. Yes, on human rights issues, on the political side, there are more dissidents probably uh, are cracking down in recent month, in recent past year also. But let's remember China probably also leading the rest of the world in prosecuting corruption officials of his own party. White Last crime. year alone, 30 some provincial level high cadres being convicted of corruption charges, some of them long sentences, some of them being executed. This is the country that is trying to move towards the rule of law step by step. So I kind of a little bit taken back by some of the very informed China experts and watchers in the West saying what we invested in China on legal reform and all that, we do not see progress. I think we need to manage our own expectations on where China is heading uh, rather than saying these are the bar that they're not met, so we need to do something else. Charles, you want to come back at that? Well, I think it's not just about human rights and domestic law, but it's also about how China interacts in, in global institutions. You know, um, is China pushing the envelope beyond the accepted limits in terms of its uh, interpretation of the WTO? 
Uh, what about the six party talks? On the one hand, China says that they want to work with the six parties to, to resolve the nuclear crisis in North Korea. And on the other hand, uh, they recently gave North Korea $10 million, billion dollars worth of aid, which seems to go against the idea that, you know, we'll support North Korea if they promise to make progress on reducing their world threat. What about China's support for the uh, regime in Burma, which, you know, is supported by Chinese trade and minerals and, and uh, wood? What about uh, China's um, uh, a, a reluctance to cooperate in the uh, Security Council with regard to sanctions against Iran's nuclear program. What about uh, what about Zimbabwe? What about Darfur? All sorts of all sorts of areas where we, we or, or for that matter Copenhagen, where we don't see China prepared to 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 work together with the other powers to ensure a, a prosperous and peaceful world. It's okay. it's a cause for concern. Let me pick up on something Wenran sang a second ago, and because it does maybe reflect the different headspace that our two respective countries or jurisdictions are in. You mentioned a long time. Now, in the West, a long time politically can be a few months. Uh, in other places in the world, and if I've got the quote wrong, I know you'll all help me out here. Was it Chairman Mao when asked about the French Revolution? What do you think of it? Said, well, still too early to say. No, Joe and Lai. Yeah. Joe and Lai? Was it Joe and Lai? Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, Gordon, it, it, have we given China enough time, not by our standards, but by their standards, to be more of what we want them to be? I think that, you know, if you look at the way societies progress, it took, for instance, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand a long time to develop from authoritarian states to more liberal democracies. And so, you know, this is a question of, of time, and it does take decades. I think the problem right now is that, as you, Charles mentioned, there are a number of very critical issues that are pressing the world, such as Iran, North Korea, climate change. And China is not at the point where it is willing to be cooperative with the rest of the international community. And I think it's a real problem because now the issue is not the direction that China is going in, but the time frame, because we need solutions now. We need China to be cooperative now. And the ultimate test, I think, of Beijing's ability to work with the international system is the one issue you mentioned, which is sanctions on Iran which looks like it's speeding towards a nuclear weapons program that would certainly destabilize not only its region, but the entire world. So this is going to be a very critical thing, and I think time is the issue. You're with, uh, Sarah, the Canada-China Business Council, so let me ask you a business question here. Okay. And, and the, the, the Google story has been the biggest business story uh, in the headlines lately when it comes to China. Some would say that this example, Chinese whoever, whether it was government officials or, or you know, hackers not affiliated with the government, uh, hacking into those Gmail accounts and trying to steal the intellectual property behind the magic algorithm that makes Google so magic. It shows that uh, making money and the cost of doing business in China is still way too high and therefore not worth it. What's your view? I, I think that's it's an isolated example and it's hard to make that general statement from that. Certainly the Google situation is is very interesting for a number of a number of reasons. You uh, of course you can see that there's a there's a, a sector, there's an industry, uh, their particular section of it, where a company does have to make a decision. Do I want to play in that uh, in that country according to the rules? And uh, and actually, it's it's quite interesting to watch how Google is really trying to shake things up by by making this threat to to leave. So on an individual company basis, you need to make that decision as to can you make enough money and how high is the price. But I think in terms of the general business community. There's a very strong feeling that being there is much more valuable than not being there. You can make more, many more changes from within than you can from without. And in addition, looking at the technology sector, there's another element of pressure on the system that is going to take its own pace regardless of what the Chinese government wants. And that's that, you know, Google, look at Google's censorship. You can get around it. People do it all the time. It takes some effort. Um, but, you know, how do you slow down technology and how does the Chinese government keep up with all of the ways to censor it? It's, it's going to be impossible in the long term. And so I love that kind of from around the fringes, there are pressures being put in ways that, uh, you know, are difficult to control. Let me hear from the others on this as well. Charles? Well, I think the thing about Google is that when Google went in, the expectation was that the Chinese censorship would reduce. But what Google says is the number of terms that they were asked to censor are increasing year by year. So you're seeing a reverse process to the expectation. But I do think with regard to the Google situation, you know, every country in the world has security agencies that, that are 
in, interested in, in looking at, at foreign emails and communications. It's, it's a normal part of, of international relations. But what China is doing is not simply looking at terrorists or, or criminals, but, but evidently, according to what, what we're told, the security agency is investigating uh, political dissidents and even people in Canada and the United States who have connections with China who are involved in the human rights movement and also industrial espionage which for the other agencies like Canada's Communication Security Establishment or the National Security Agency of the United States, it's not something that they would do. And so there again, you know, there's an unspoken sort of consensus of acceptable behavior and China seems to be moving beyond the sort of what is allowed. You know, within the, like you take the, the WTO, no nation follows the WTO terms to the letter. There's a kind of space that's, that's acceptable for for, you know, for, for moving in your own national interest. But it seems that in the case of China, China moves beyond the space uh, and, and starts to, to try and apply norms which are not the consensus of the global community. And I think, I think the Google example is, is, is a, a clear example of how China and, and the rest of us are not really on the same page about how we should be relating to each other. Wen Ren Zhang, what does well, the, uh, the Google situation yeah, say to you? Let's just break down the Google story a little bit more mm -hmm. rather than making some of the general assumptions I don't think is really stands well. I myself do not like censorship at all. I use Google myself. I think the Chinese, many of the young people like to have Google in China. And Google provides good opportunities. I think Google's original decision in 2006, the rationale for going to China, it still stands correct. That is, to be there providing the limited information is better to provide uh, no information at all. But let's look at it. Google.cn has very little percentage of market. The Google.com is still open to the Chinese. So if tomorrow Google leaves China, there's still room for Chinese to grow. This doomsday scenario somehow, if Google tomorrow leaving China, China's 380 million largest internet user will be just collapsed. It's actually laughable. No, but can China I understand would that? go on. on to its own pace. Let me just understand this. Yeah. Google.cn is, is in Chinese. Chinese language right. search engine. So Google.com presumably would not be helpful for the so many for the many people who don't speak you English. You can still search in Chinese in there and you can still use it. What I'm saying is Google in China would be helpful. <clears throat> but tomorrow Google leaves China as the way they threaten it uh, is not going to be very helpful to the most Chinese users. But it's also the second point related to this is about espionage, about the uh, warfare on the cyberspace. There is so far no proof. Am I listening to Google CEO or am I going to listening to a Microsoft CEO and Bill Gates and others who said thousands of these attacks go on daily? What is the proof on Google's claim? There was no proof. Now the National Security Agency just got involved to investigate. They say it might be someone in Shanghai wrote a code and posted it on the internet and some others use that code to attack. So we really don't know. So therefore, I think we should not jump into conclusions and paint all this, the Chinese government as the bad guy and we're all the good guys. It's actually a lot more complex. Gordon? I think one of the interesting things about Google is the context in which it occurred. Since about the middle of 2006, the Chinese government has really made it very difficult for foreign investors in China. They have been restricting takeovers. They've been having all, issuing all sorts of rules that require the transfer of technology all sorts of things that favor local competitors, especially in connection with the stimulus program that Beijing announced in November 2008. So essentially what you've got is a much more difficult environment. And what Google is basically saying is that, yes, there's an advantage to being in China, but on the other hand, there's a cost. And they're starting to weigh, well, maybe the cost is worth, is more than the advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a real watershed for business. I don't know if Google will leave, but I think that what you're starting to see among um, foreign businessmen and women in China is more of an appreciation of maybe it's not important to be there if the costs are that high. Sarah? Yeah, well, and that's an equation that every company has to make because it has to make financial sense. Um, what you've mentioned about some of the uh, difficulties in doing business and re which really leads to kind of the protection issue is definitely something we're watching at the council. Um, just some of the regulatory procedures and, uh, and, and hoops that people need to jump through uh, in many cases have been getting harder. And China has been changing regulations in many ways to 
subtly, sort of, or not so subtly, protect its, its, its own companies. And a, a good example of that is this indigenous innovation policy that came out a couple months ago, which basically says if, uh, if you're going to be involved in government procurement, there will be preference given to uh, intellectual property that comes from Chinese companies. Okay, but, but weigh it for us, if you would. The, the co there is a cost to staying in China, whether it's the cost of dealing with all this bureaucracy or the cost of... Uh, you know, a hit on Google's reputation for putting up with some of the things that it wouldn't put up with in other countries. Uh, how do you weigh that cost-benefit analysis at the moment? Ultimately, I think you have to you have to do it at the company level. Does it does it fit with your company's values, and will your shareholders approve? And well, their values at, we know are do no evil, right? That's yeah. number one. Yeah. Are they doing evil by staying and putting up with this? Well, not if, as Wenran says, by being there. You can you can feel like you're making a contribution to progress. Okay, Charles. I mean, let's get clear on this. Um, you cannot access any Blogspot blogs from China, including mine. Not just for me. It's there. All the Blogspot blogs, including the ones about people's cats, are not available. You cannot access. Sorry, not available meaning blocked. They're blocked. You cannot. Blogspot.com pulls up an error mm -hmm. message. If you do the searches on Google.com, you get the same censorship as, as, mm -hmm. as Google.cn. It's not as if you can somehow go through that. YouTube is not available. You cannot post your Google Docs from within China. I mean, really, when you look at it, what Google services are, are unaffected uh, in China by the Great Firewall, uh, pretty much all of them. So you could see why uh, the do no evil guys would think that evil is being done there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, uh, it's hard for me to work in China when I, can't, when I can't post to my blog or access it, or I like to watch YouTube. Uh, I, I don't even know if I can get the agenda in China. Maybe not this show, for well, sure. <laughs> okay, when uh, I think this issue, uh, I, I agree with Charles on the censorship part. Uh, I think the issue of Google versus China really is a bigger issue uh, of how the West is approaching and engaging China today. Uh, China, as it is, we acknowledge some of the historical progress. We also see the limitations today. And the issue is how do we engage China? Are we going to basically do a confrontational approach as Google has been doing? Or we're going to say engage with China and to move China in a direction in a limited manner as we can play external forces, corporations, governments, but it's the Chinese themselves will eventually move China forward through their own internal dynamics. <laughs> I think mean, these are the important issues we need to look at. On the issue of Google or other companies uh, having a political cost in China for doing business, I think it's important to look at this is a logic of global capitalism playing. Chinese leadership, if anything, in the past three decades have been having a grand bargain with the global capitalism, mm -hmm. coming in with a lot of benefits for foreign capital and depressed uh, you know, salary, damage to the environment, a lot of manufacturing goods. So that's where China is today. Okay, let me get a couple more quick comments on this part first, yeah. Sarah, and then Charles. Well, on the uh, uh, convincing the Chinese leaders to make changes and whether or not you can make an argument for that being of benefit to within. I think the Green Dam example from last summer is an excellent example. Uh, this was the encryption software that the government was going to require to be put on every single computer sold f from within China. And there was a lot of action on the part of interested companies, associations. We participated in a 21 association group that wrote letters to ministers and vice premiers. And the Chinese government stood down right, right, right around the deadline. Line. And as much as we wanted to think that was our efforts that helped that, the word on the street is that the real reason they made that uh, that decision was that the Chinese blogosphere was really up in arms about it. You know, and they were influenced by that. That's what that's what that's we hear. That's the word hear. on the street. Yes. Okay, Charles. I would just say with regard to the you know Google engaging China is a good thing. Uh, when Google started in China, you could in fact access YouTube and Blogspot and Google. Uh, well, Google Docs didn't exist then, but you know, it's it's a backwards progress, not a forwards progress. The longer Google's in China, the less Google you can you can get. I think you know when you look at it in general. Um, you know, when I was in China in the 70s, they were also doing political systemic reform, as you say. It's 30 years ago, and then they had another go of it. Uh, heading up in the late 80s under Zhao Ziyang, which was crushed by the Tiananmen movement. Then we had another go of it in uh, leading up to 1998 for the 20th anniversary of political systemic reform. And uh, now we're in 2010. It's been 30 years. Uh, you know, I, I started off 24. Now I'm 54. <laughs> another 30 years, I'll be dead. I'm, I'm wondering when this political systemic reform thing is going to kick in. And I'm is there any sort of 
indication of anything progressive, or are we in fact only seeing, um, in fact, backwards? I'm confident not only will you be alive, but you will be here at the Monk Center and we'll reconvene this discussion <laughs> and you'll be here for it. I look forward to That's that. That's what I think. Maybe uh, it will be visible in China then. <laughs> Note to uh, Director Michael Smith in the control room, let's do the little Mike Minor reminder now at the middle of page five and then we'll do the New York Times board after that if we can. Remember, if uh, we say to the folks at home, if you couldn't be here tonight, our fifth column blogger Mike Minor is on our homepage at tvo.org slash the agenda where he is moderating an online chat. So if you'd like to get involved in some of the issues that you're hearing here tonight, share your views with some of your other viewers or viewsers, please dial us up at tvo.org slash the agenda and join the chat. And a reminder that at 9 p.m. Eastern time, after we're off the air on television, we'll have the opportunity to put your comments or questions to our guests who are going to stay behind here for another 15 or 20 minutes or so. So go onto the website right now and give us your comments and questions and we'll put them in afterwards. Okay, let's go then to that New York Times. Here's Min Chin Pei uh, from just um, last week in the New York Times. The two countries, China and the U.S., are now so economically intertwined that a major disruption in their political relationship could severely damage their respective economic interests, a price neither wants to pay. Economic interdependence also means that neither China nor the U.S. can hurt the other without harming itself. In spite of the heated words in the official Chinese press, it is reassuring to note that Beijing and Washington are merely fighting the same old fights, Taiwan, Tibet, and human rights. Both sides are familiar with the ground rules for these disputes and so far have observed them. Okay, Gordon, you first on this. Do you believe trade with China has had benefits even without the democratic reforms that many in the West hope for? Absent that, has it still been a positive story? Well, sure. Trade has been positive for China. It's been positive for the United States. You know, that's generally true about trade between any two countries. And so I certainly think that, um, you know, both countries have benefited. But that doesn't necessarily mean that both countries see the same going forward. And so even though, you know, Minch and Pei can think, well, you know, it's always been okay in the past, it should be okay in the future, it's a very different world we live in. You know, China prospered in the post-Cold War period of seemingly never-ending globalization and, and increasing amounts of wealth. But, you know, since the middle of 2008, we've been living in a very different world. And so, therefore, these disagreements that we have, which may be the same, Tibet, Taiwan, trade, whatever, um, now take on greater significance because the world, you know, countries have a very different attitude towards global trade, among a lot of other things. And so we're in a different era, and so therefore I think that these um, disputes could become much more serious and much more consequential. And so I don't think we can rely on what we knew in the past because this is a very different global environment that we're in. Okay, Charles, your legitimate criticisms that you've put forward this evening notwithstanding, we do have to point out that even though things are tense, there's no war. There doesn't seem to be any threat of war between the United States and China. There are hundreds of millions of extremely poor Chinese who have been lifted out of poverty by virtue of the, you know, liberalized trade that goes on between the two countries. So can we not say that even in the absence of the democratic reforms you want to say, there's a lot of good news here to report? Oh, absolutely. I think in terms of economic, social, and cultural rights, you know, things have improved. Uh, having, as, as you know, I lived in China in the 70s and I saw some terrible poverty and uh, you know the numbers of people living in absolute poverty that's they don't have enough to keep their bellies full and enough to keep their bodies warm has gone down probably by uh, you know uh, 85 percent <laughs> over that period so that's got to be a, a very positive thing and people are able to live more dignified dignified lives in China and that's a, a very positive thing I do think that what's happening though with the marketization of the economy with the increasing polarization of wealth while there's been overall growth it's been disproportionate and the the coastal cities are are enriching themselves much faster than the than the interior and this this then uh, is risky in terms of continued political stability eventually people feel that the trickle down effect is not trickling down to them sufficiently and it causes even though they're better off than they were before their resentment is greater because their expectations have not been fulfilled that threatened political instability has been forecast for a long long time hasn't happened yet i, I hope it doesn't happen and uh, you know we will be meeting in thirty years and, and <laughs> we can discuss it at that time but i i do think that that this situation of increasing polarization of wealth is a relatively new and and increasing phenomenon and, and I do think a lot of the a lot of China's behavior with with the foreign countries is really responsive to domestic concerns okay let me follow up with Wenren Jiang and I'm gonna read something uh, that Daniel Dresner whom we all know he's been on this program as we've tackled this topic many times in the past I think he's Tufts University isn't he Daniel Dresner 
Anyway, here's what he had to say on foreign policy. From cyber attacks to obstinacy in Copenhagen, Beijing's assertiveness and the hardening tone of its diplomacy are prompting a rethink. If the competitive aspects of the relationship with China are going to dominate in the years ahead, have the United States and Europe got their strategies right? Talk of giving Beijing more space on sensitive issues has evaporated. Support from business lobbies has weakened. Heads of government who would happily push China into the important but not urgent file have begun to review their strategies. In which case, do you think the West ought to be taking a harder line on China so that China will do more of what the West would like? Well, a short answer is that a harder line, a so-called pushback, would be uh, counterproductive. But let's step back a little bit. Look at, say, the past decade. Which country or the countries in the world actually has the largest foreign policy failures and blunders? You know, where in the world around that war is going on, civil civilians constantly being killed and not even making the front page news? I mean, Chinese having a lot of problems. They could have done a lot more on the foreign policy area. But look, China has been uh, in the foreign policy area, I would say globally, if you measure it, pretty moderate. On North Korea, uh, earlier Charles uh, mentioned, on North Korea, China is the one that proposed engagement and is producing a, a, you know, latest effect is that the North is coming back to the six party talks mm -hmm. and is opening up for pol political and economic reform, pr primarily in the economic side. Those are economic incentives Beijing provided. Call it carrot you know, uh, versus you know, sugar or you, know, mm -hmm. you, you, you can you know, stake whichever right. way you're doing it. So on Iran, China does not see fundamentally the nuclear issue on Iran is a China's core national interest. It is American and Western European agenda. China does not want Iran to have nuclear weapons. They made it clear. But it is the approach of how to stop that nuclear weapons program is the difference of the core. Well, they differ. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the West needs to take a tougher line on China, Gordon? Well, maybe not necessarily tougher, but a different one. You know, we would all like to think that if we're conciliatory to the Chinese, that they'll be conciliatory to us. But after 30 years, you know, I think that what we have seen is that China respects strength much more than friendship, which they sometimes they even despise if they think that it is a sign of weakness. So I think that what we need to do is we need to stop making excuses for China. I think that we need to stop treating it as a special case. Sure. You, you pointed at Wenren when you said that. <laughs> oh, I did? Making excuses I didn't for China? realize I did that. Yeah, you, we, oh, here's sorry. what you did. You said we need to stop making excuses for China, <laughs> and you pointed at him. Did you mean to suggest that he is? Yeah, I think that he probably is. Because I I'll think respond. the one thing that we really need <laughs> yeah. to do is we need to expect from China what we expect from every other country, and that is reciprocity. And we haven't been doing that. Okay, you better, I better give you a chance to come back at that. I think uh, yeah. if Gordon, uh, which I respect a lot, has written extensively on China, on globalization, on North Korea, and I just hope that you're being from the United States, you can step up on the human rights issues to the U.S. government as much as we talk about the Chinese government. I think that's very important. If we look at the global stage, I'm not making excuses. There's no excuses for China to make on the foreign policy area. What they do on the blender side, I do not see the scale of the Iraq war or, you know, uh, so of that scale. Just so I'm clear, you're, you're suggesting the United States has as many human rights violations as China does? I mean, I'm, we're talking about we need to measure the bar at the same level. Okay. Rather than picking on China, I'm not accusing Gordon in any way of making excuses okay, Sarah's for shaking US, your head but, here. Go ahead. Uh, but nor should we lose the balance on the issue. You Sarah, know? You, you shook your head there. Well, I, I, I think you know, the core of the problem is that there, an expectation has developed that China should be a good multilateral actor. They acceded to the WTO. All of the processes seem to be in place to say they were going to be good, good global citizens. And now there are some indications that they're not performing on that, uh, on, on, on that front. And interestingly, at you know everybody talks about Copenhagen, where uh, you know China really took a very hard line. At Davos, they sent Li Keqiang to basically say we're really needing to focus on our own internal issues. We're not going to be able to do as much global cooperation as you might like, uh, and we're really focusing internally. So it almost comes back to the stability issue, where you know what do they need to do to make sure that there's economic growth that creates stability um, to keep to keep things going. 
um, the way they want them to. But what that means is that the expectation that sort of with great wealth, which may not be wealth on a per capita basis, but in terms of the rest of the world, they're very powerful, but they're not able to show on the other aspects of a good multilateral actor that they're playing a part. Let me just hear from Charles on the issue of whether the West needs to take a tougher line, then we'll come into the audience. Uh, I, I mean, tougher is, is a... Is a is a very strong word. I think a smarter line, I think a more honest line in interaction between um, China and the West. There's a lot of distrust on both sides and I think it's, it would be better if we were franker with each other about our, our interests and, and, uh, and not play these sorts of games. And so I, I think that that's the future. Uh, both sides have to take each other more seriously and realize that we have to work together for global peace and prosperity and therefore we should, um, you know, stop stop pretending things that we don't mean. For example, the Western government's so-called engagement with China on political issues. This is designed to undermine the basis of the current regime in China and bring about a, a different society that wouldn't be led by the Chinese Communist Party. It's probably inappropriate for governments directly to be engaging in that kind of interaction with China, which naturally would cause the Chinese government to doubt the motivations of these governments in other areas. We should be maybe doing it on a you know, not a government-to-government -government basis, but a people-to-people -people basis. So I think it's time for more honesty and more, more engagement and, and, and more trust building between the two sides. Okay, back here, please, everybody. First question of the night. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm really interested in the notion of uh, exporting or trying to improve democracy in China. Surely, if we want China to become a real democracy, we should allow themselves to define democracy by their own means rather than implementing a so-called Western system of democracy. And furthermore, that also extends to democracy in foreign policy. If we are to use China agreeing with us on international agreements as a gauge to measure cooperation, then we have failed, surely. Gordon, should we let them define the kind of democracy they want to become if they do want to, in fact, do that? Well, the Chinese people are going to basically are going to determine the fate of China. And it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be us. And it's even maybe not even going to be the Communist Party. It's going to be 1.5 billion Chinese. But, uh, you know, the Chinese want exactly the same things that everybody else around the world wants because they're people too. You know, they want more say in their lives. And, and one way or another, they're going to get it. And, um, the big obstacle right now is the, the current one-party state. So, yeah, I, I think that the Chinese people are actually going to determine their own fate, and I think they're going to determine it very, very soon. Well, how, when, when is very, very soon? I think that with, certainly within this half decade, maybe within a couple of years, we're going to be having very different conversations about China than we do today because the government and the country is going through a very tumultuous period, and a lot of what we've known about China is just no longer true. Wen Rang Zhang, when is very, very, first of all, do you agree that it's going to happen very, very soon? Well, I don't think it's going to happen very soon in terms of a open up total reform. I think the question from our audience is a very smart one. That is, maybe we should let the Chinese manage their own system to define what democracy means, opening, openness means for them. Look, among all these four people, I wasn't the one that grew up in China going through the starvation in the 1960s, going through the turbulence of the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, 70s. I've seen all those over the decades, and now where we are, I guess what I see China is more of a society-driven process rather than the state is everything. I think the progress made today is not the state granted, the people the progress. That's where we come together, Gordon. Yes. The people make the progress and push the state. The state as we see, say, China, the one-party regime, but the state is not a monolithic block. The state itself has different segments. There are those who constantly push for more reform. They push for the envelope. There are societal feedbacks, even there is no election. So the Chinese society is very complex and moving forward on its own pace. My prediction is that it will move forward in its own pace slowly, but towards more openness. It's maybe two step forward, one step back, but the motion and trajectory into the future would be more like in the past 30 years. So you're not looking, as Gordon would, to say something happening in the next couple of years, but maybe the next couple of decades. Well, Gordon wrote a book about 10 years ago saying China is going to collapse in five to 10 years. I, 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 I'll keep his bet and uh, <laughs> I, I'm, on the, on the, I'm on the negative side and I will see who, <laughs> who goes with that. I'm waiting for his volume two, so. <laughs> we have to make a bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right back here, please. Uh, Dr. Charles already made this, uh, he rose the question about China's uh, human rights violations and the issue of Darfur. I'm going to leave Copenhagen out of it, but 
Um, how can you say, like, this point has already been made, but how can you compare China to any other Western or European country who has not managed to live up or even act on Darfur, on climate change, or effectively act on it? How can you expect China, who has been the fastest recovery, recovering nation in the economic meltdown, to you know, even put them in that situation that you're, you're putting them down, down for not living, uh, not taking action on Darfur. When, okay, let's get when an answer. Charles, what do you say? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, Darfur is a, is, a, is a human tragedy of enormous proportions, and I, 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 I would take your point that, you know, all nations should be more engaged in, in trying to resolve this, this tragedy. But, you know, I, I think that in the discussion there's a lot of dis use of the word the Chinese, and I, I think that we do have to distinguish between the regime, the Chinese regime, which has certain imperatives, and the Chinese people. And I think the Chinese people um, are typically supportive of the values of liberal democracy. It's not as if there's socialist democracy that, that they believe is superior and that our democracy is, is an inferior capitalist form. That's why China has to, that's why the Chinese government has to censor so much and not allow the people to know about things because the people would agree if they, if they had the information. But I think his question is more along the lines of who the hell are we to tell them anything given our appalling record on human rights in the West, for example, in Darfur? Well, I think that China is a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, which does give them greater responsibilities for being more engaged on these issues. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't, uh, as a Canadian, I'm, I'm not interested in the, um, you know, China-U.S. comparison, or which country is has less moral virtue. I'm, I'm really interested in, in, um, you know, how we can bring about a better global order and and respect the universal values which which should be guiding the world. And and one of them would be that the United Nations should not be tolerating the actions of the government of Sudan and Darfur, and we should be, you know, proactively trying to to rescue those people from the hell that they're living in and have been living in for a very long time. Okay, question here, please. I'd just like to ask a question about the Tibet issue, and uh, I'm curious to hear your um, thoughts about what the Chinese government's uh, intentions are and what their motivations are in terms of how they're treating the Tibet issue, uh, in particular with His Holiness Dalai Lama getting older, um, and an increasingly radical youth in Tibet, and more impatient youth uh, also in exile as well. Uh, so maybe to speak to what their intentions are, what their thoughts are on the issue, and how they think that's going to play out. Anybody in particular you want to see tackle that, or can I throw it to anyone? Anybody. Okay. Wen Ren Zhang, why Sorry, don't you go I first? I actually missed the question a little bit. Down. Can you repeat the, that? The, uh, what, what, what's China up to when it comes to the Dalai Lama? Well, this is another area we see huge perception gaps, like in the uh, uh, global warming division on Taiwan. The Chinese, I think, uh, has not handled the Tibetan issue very well uh, at all. Uh, their perception is that somehow the Dalai Lama is a separate force. I think they're not up to date in terms of engaging the Dalai Lama, but what they see, they put in the international relations angle and saying this is Western countries the United States and others using Dalai Lama as a card. So therefore, they push back uh, coming from the sovereignty issues, and that will not solve the Tibetan issue in the long run. And I don't think that they have come around in there. And the Western countries, with all the assurances, saying, OK, we're not using Tibet, trying to separate China, and still yet to find a better way of letting the Chinese know that they're not trying to this in, you know, this dismantle China. So the perception gap of what the Western intention and what the Chinese want to achieve is, is very much wide apart at the moment. Charles, brief follow-up? Well, I think that, uh, you know, I think the Chinese government may be waiting for the Dalai Lama to, to move on to another reincarnation. Um, uh, that, that's a terribly mistaken policy because the Dalai Lama is clearly the best, the best hope for moderation in, in Tibet. He's holding together uh, some very vicious factions in the, among uh, the Tibetan government in exile in Dharamsala and among Tibetans in Tibet. And the best bet for ensuring a peaceful future in Tibet, in my view, would be for China to uh, take the Dalai Lama seriously and engage him in a, in a way to set about a basis for, for a, 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 a peaceful uh, uh, Tibet within uh, the, 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 the control of Beijing. And, and I, 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 I really uh, am very worried about the future of Tibet as the Dalai Lama gets older and even talks about retirement. 
Sarah, I, do, I don't mean this to sound flip, but is the Dalai Lama and that, that whole dispute with Tibet, is that bad for business? Well, you know, we have some members that have uh, operations in Tibet, and so certainly when China cracks down on Tibet and it limits their access, that, uh, that's bad for business. Um, you know, any, any sort of political disputes like this uh, can have certain effects, but they are not always general effects on all, all companies. Question back here, please. So, uh, so you mentioned that there was a hope for a rise of a middle class Chinese PayPal. When do you think that's going to happen, and uh, how will it affect the um, the economic, political, and generally the global perspective. Gordon, what's the status of the attempts to create a Chinese middle class? Where is it at? Well, depending on how you define middle class, there could be as many as 300 or 400 million middle class Chinese. The problem is that you've got a number of, of people in that class, as well as other classes, that although they're happy with the general economic development, Nonetheless, they are concerned with the way things are going in the Chinese economy. Because as we've talked about here, there does seem to be a rollback. Um, you know, China progressed because of the creation and the development of the private sector, as Wen Ren hinted at. And, and now you see a renationalization of the Chinese economy through the stimulus program through the last year or so. So this is, I think, is playing pretty badly among many Chinese, especially the academics, middle class people who are actually being hurt by all of this. Um, because essentially what you've got is a, an economic structure that is geared towards exports and government investment. And it's not geared towards consumption, which is consumption is what helps the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, consumption in China as a, role, as, a, as a role in the economy is the lowest in the world, perhaps below 30 percent, and getting lower as we speak. So this is an economy that's moving in the wrong direction. Let me just ask Sarah, we've got a couple of minutes left here, and we, we have talked mostly about the United States and China tonight. Let's spend a couple of minutes on Canada right now. Okay. You know that when uh, Stephen Harper's government first came in, there was a much tougher sort of, I don't know if belligerent is the right line, but there, there, it was a tougher line towards China than we had been accustomed to seeing in the past. Right. And then that went away. And it's now, you know, he's been, it's more conciliatory. Has the change in approach and tone made a difference? Absolutely. How so? Uh, for example, one of, our, one of our member companies was telling me just a couple weeks ago that following a trip by Minister Flaherty to China in, in August, they saw increasing ease in the approvals of, of applications for, uh, for, for business licenses that they were undergoing. That's very, very important. Um, we, we'd been saying for a couple of years that the chill in political relations was having an impact on business, and we started seeing it. And uh, the warming, rewarming of relations definitely has, uh, has, has a positive impact, and it's why there was such a, a large support for his trip by the business community. Charles, can I hear you on that? Well, I, I think that the Prime Minister's trip to China has been a good thing in the sense that he did make a comment in Shanghai that he felt that Canada had barely scratched the surface on the potential for Canadian engagement with China. So, I, I, you know, Canada got the uh, approved destination status for tourism under Stephen Harper. It, we tried to get it under Mr. Martin and Mr. Crenshaw, so it suggests that the Harper policy has paid off in terms of substantive benefits to the relationship. The Harper policy of being tough first? Yes, I think so. I think that we've gained more respect under Mr. Harper than when we were engaging in the quiet diplomacy, which seemed to give tacit consent to China's human rights abuses because we wouldn't speak out, because we wanted to do it quietly. In our last 30 seconds, then, if the tough approach worked, why did we get more conciliatory? Well, I, 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 Mr. Harper has said that his policy has not changed, so I'm not sure that the conciliatory is, is anything more than the perception, but I'm very happy that we're more engaged with China, and the Prime Minister and Ministers going there has got to be a good thing. Okay. That's going to be the last word on the broadcast section of the program tonight. I'm going to remind you of a couple of things. Number one, at least you, but I'm hoping that all four of you are going to reconvene here in 30 years when Charles is 84, and we can have this out again and see how everything has transpired. Anyway, <laughs> you'll all be around. You'll all be young kids. You can still do it. Thanks to all four of you for being there for us tonight on television. I want to thank our audience for coming out this evening. But, of course, we're not done with everybody yet. Uh, stay tuned for more information on that. We do want to add that for more information on our guest tonight and a series of papers about China published by the Canadian International Council, visit our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda. We also want to tell you that tonight's program was produced most expertly by Daniel Kitts. Thank you, Daniel, for all your work tonight. 
You can also see a recap of tonight's live chat on our Inside Agenda Producers blog. You can go there anytime, tvo.org slash the agenda, where in just a few minutes we're going to start our live web chat after 9 p.m. Eastern Time, so please stay tuned for that. Stay with us. We're right back with a programming note right after this. you think. Funding for the Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Vale Inco Limited, a pioneering nickel mining company transforming mineral resources into essential ingredients for everyday life. Ontario's 33,000 chartered accountants, public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at casforchange.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Thursday, February 25th, 2010. A couple of programming reminders we want to leave you with tonight before we go. Those of you watching us tonight in eastern Ontario, a reminder, we're coming to your neighborhood this weekend, all day long Sunday. We'll have our agenda camp. You're still welcome to go to our website, sign up and attend. We're going to be talking about the issues that are of importance to Eastern Ontario in terms of reinventing Ontario. Followed up, of course, Monday night by our live broadcast from Brockville, Monday night, March the 1st. Uh, some seats still available for that, so go to our website for all the details. We're on the road again. And tomorrow night, three feature interviews on three different countries. Lee Dong-hui on South Korea's foreign policy. Amy Ball on the success and shortcomings of Iraq's Kurdistan region, and Ito Pung on Japan's recent political shift. Three regions of the world we want to take a look at tomorrow night. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO. Join us online now at tvo.org slash the agenda, where in just a moment we're going to start our live post-program web chat. Hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone.